So what's queer about the Renaissance? And I'm going to tell you a lot, a lot is queer about the Renaissance for heaven's sake. So let's look at a timeline because I always like to have a timeline. And so this is the early Renaissance. You can see the early Renaissance and where Michelangelo and Leonardo are. And Leonardo was younger than Michelangelo. He was about 25 years younger. And then also Artemisia Gentileschi. And that's what we're going to be talking about with some tangential people again tonight. So when you're talking about the Renaissance, it happens between the late 1300s into the mid 16 or about 1600. And, uh, and that's the period. So yeah, you are here. This is where we are right now. Um, <clears throat> now during the Renaissance, important to remember that we had some really significant things. There's Judy needs to come into the way to, to the, the thing. I hope it's Judy Arndt. Um, the, one of the things we had was the Gutenberg print, printing press, which was a big deal. It's changed everything. And uh, to be able to have literature printed and people to be able to get it was a big, big change in the world. It's like having, you know, personal computers only on a piece of paper. We also have a lot of exploration. We have Columbus. Uh, I was right in the middle of the Renaissance. We have the Protestant Reformation. So we have Martin Luther and the breaking off for, from the, uh, from the, um, Catholic Church, <clears throat> and we have the Age of Enlightenment, and then we have plague and plague and plague. Plague is all about the Renaissance, and, and, and this was, you know, we have a plague now, and we know how horrible that is, but when we talk about plague, we're talking about entire towns just being completely wiped out from horrible, horrible plague that nobody knows where it's coming from, and nobody knows how to stop it. Um, and, and it was tough. So, uh, so that's right in the middle of them then too. And of course we have Shakespeare, which is a big deal. And we have art, a lot of significant art. Major, major changes in Western art happened during the Renaissance. And I'm gonna talk about one of them right now. So in the past, Egyptian, Greek, Roman and medieval periods brought art about religion and mythology. But that's about it. What is the Renaissance? Here's your prize opportunity. What does the Renaissance uniquely add to painting? Two things I'm looking for in this. What's the first thing? And I'll give you a little hint. Oh, there, there's the hint. Okay, yeah. All right, that was a pretty direct hint. So the big, the big hint there, first of all, is, but what's the other one? Yes, you're very good, Eric. I, I, you, yeah, but you don't get a prize. Um, uh, I gave it away. So of course, when we see um, Mo the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa was actually a, a portrait of a woman who lived down the street. It was not a big deal with regard to, uh, you know, all sorts of mythology and stuff. We had actual portraiture that happened during the Renaissance. And of course, that was a Leonardo painting. Um, but and before it was just myths and historical allegory. Sometimes they'd paint pictures of famous people as those allegorical figures, but just to have somebody sit down and get a portrait was a factor of the Renaissance. But what else came from the Renaissance? What else significant? Science and technology. Okay, science and technology is, is important, but I'm talking about painting. Okay. <laughs> so nice try. Perspective. Yes, yes. Give that person a piece of, of um, Oh, okay. So uh, Genevieve wants me to enable the closed captioning, and I certainly will do that. Is it coming up? Oh, it's too small. So how do I make that bigger? Let me let me make it a little bit bigger for you all too. So you can see where I'm supposed to do that on here. Oh, yes, I see it. Okay, let's make it bigger. There we go. This is so amazing that this can just. Um, uh, see that. So there we go. Okay, so it's going to say weird things that I'm not actually saying, but um, some of it will be true. I'll try to speak clearly. Um, okay, so yes, this person says perspective, and that you are exactly right. Perspective is a big deal about the Renaissance, and here is an example of it. This is one point perspective. This is the example of one point perspective, and <clears throat> This painting was, was one of the first paintings that actually began to demonstrate this really significant use of one point perspective, which I'm gonna explain in a minute. Um, and it's linear. And this was done by Brunelleschi in, in 1415, which was very early for this kind of perspective. 
So um, here's how one point perspective works. One point perspective is absolutely a concept that isn't really true because while this looks like these lines are converging in the back, they aren't really. But here's the way it works. So one point perspective means that you have this horizon line, there it is, and a vanishing point. And that's where everything converges to. And this is one point perspective when you're looking at something straight on from the front. Everything going from the foreground to the background ends up at that line. And everything that's, again, so foreground to the background, that's straight lines ends up at the vanishing point. So it all does that kind of stuff, see? Now, um, everything on the ground or parallel to the ground is parallel to the horizon line. So that means this stuff, all does absolutely parallel to the horizon line, if you're looking straight at it. And then <clears throat> everything that's perpendicular to the ground, if it's straight up and down, is perpendicular to the horizon line. This is very mathematical. And that's one of the reasons why math and science are significant to this. So you can see these perpendicular lines and they're perpendicular to the horizon line. Okay, so, so that's how one point perspective works. Now, this is how that can be extrapolated into making an object that looks like it's 3D. So here's a horizon line and here's a box and it's below the horizon line to show the top of the box in perspective. So what you do is you have the horizon line, you have the vanishing point and you have these lines going back into the vanishing point. This is one point perspective. And the farther the lines go back, the closer they get together and end up at the vanishing point. But if you cut them off, <clears throat> There's the lines. If you cut them off, take them away, that's the top of the box. And it looks like it's getting smaller in the back. That's how one point perspective works when you're talking about an object. When you're talking about an object where the thing is in the middle of it, you're looking into it, there's the vanishing point at the bottom of that arrow. And then the lines go from the corners to the vanishing point. And then you drive another box inside, and it looks like there's depth in the box. So that's one point perspective. And this stuff, was all discovered in the Renaissance. It was not used by anybody else before that time. And this is not something that you just know. You have to be taught this. And it happened because there's a bunch of geniuses um, who were figuring this out. And it took about two to 300 years to really figure out how to draw this perspective. <clears throat> and now, as a result, one point perspective gives you this kind of image. Okay. So in the early part of the Renaissance, in the 1300s, this is a Giotto painting, and you can see that he's trying to figure it out, but he's screwing it up. It's not right. And you can see that the lines aren't really converging and they're all different and stuff, and he doesn't understand how it really seems. And so this, as I said, is Giotto, and this is in the 1300s. <clears throat> and that's when he lived. And, um, and yet this painting, is by uh, Masaccio, and this is also 1415, and this is correct. So if you look at the one point perspective in this, it's correct. It's all going to one point, which is not what Giotto was doing. So um, here's a great example. This is a, a not anonymous painting, but it's a great example of all of these buildings and everything, and all the sides and the points and everything follow that formula straight up and down. The lines are all converging on the vanishing point. And this is only happening in Italy. Nobody else is figuring out it. It began to, people began to teach people in other parts of Europe, but this was happening in Italy during the Renaissance. And it's a learned societal skill. It's not something that everybody just knows how to do. <clears throat> now in the Ming Dynasty, which is at the same time, you can see, and this is in China, you can see that even though they had fabulous art during the Ming Dynasty, the perspective is incorrect. It's not that Western perspective where you have a single vanishing point. And so here's a great example of, of how this works. Even making figures, so even the concept of making figures in the background smaller than making but then figures in the foreground is a learned construct. So in other words, in this, you can see the boat that's in the front 
uh, in the lower part, the people are littler than the people in the back. And that's something you learn. You, don't, you, you have to understand that visually we see these things that are closer to you bigger. Um, and also what they did was the famous important person is the biggest person. It doesn't have to do with where they are. It has to do with who they are. So this guy is the big guy. He's the big, big guy on campus. Okay, meanwhile, back in Italy, you can't have this, which is something from the Renaissance, uh, or this without two-point perspective, okay? So two-point perspective means that you have two vanishing points and you're looking at things from the corner. So two-point perspective, here's the horizon line, <clears throat> and there's the front of the corner of a box or a building. And there's vanishing point, vanishing point one and two, and what you do is again, perpendicular from that angled line, you go straight up, you can go through the horizon line, and then you connect the top of those lines to the vanishing point. And you do that you could, to the other vanishing point. You connect the top of those lines to the vanishing point on the other side, and then these straight up and down lines, they have to be perpendicular to the horizon line. And then as you do that, if you wanna see the top of the box, you put it below the horizon line, and then you connect those lines both to vanishing point two and then also vanishing point one. And you can see it over here too. So that's going back to vanishing point two. And as a result of that, it looks like it's three-dimensional boxes or buildings. And here's an example of the building. And this is, again, all stuff that was figured out by these painters and artists and mathematicians in the Age of Enlightenment in Renaissance at the time. So you go from this, and look at that box with a cross on it, <clears throat> that's a Giotto, to, to this, let's see, that's 1300, to this. And this is a Raphael painting that has that box on it that looks actually three-dimensional. In the Giotto painting, the back uh, of the, or the sides are going away from each other instead of going toward a vanishing point. And the ones in the uh, Raphael are going toward each other. And that's a big deal about paint. So <clears throat> Raphael with a 3D box. And that's the 1500s, 200 years later. And it's a good. Now, let's talk about Leonardo da Vinci. So there's Leonardo da Vinci. Um, mid 1400s to, to 1519. Um, and he's a, a big deal guy. So here he is at 24. Here he is at 67. He died when he was 67 years old. Um, these are self portraits or portraits by other people. I like it that he has this little dog. Like, so, you know, it's such a selfie. Like, here let, here, let me take this picture with my dog. Um, he was a painter, an inventor, a musician a medical expert, let's see those. He, these are his, some from his notebooks, medical expert, expert. there's uh, intestines, there's inventions, he was an inventor, here's musical instruments that he invented, here's incredible um, scale drawings of different kinds, uh, in perspective of different kinds of uh, uh, gears and things to make, of uh, chains and all sorts of things like that. He was a botanist, he was an architect, <clears throat> He was a genius. And you know, I always try to say that about women all the time, and I will be saying that about women, but, um, but there is no question that Leonardo da Vinci was a, an amazing genius. Um, here's a little resume that he sent to uh, Ludvico Sforza, for, Sforza of Milan. So he was the, like the ruler of Milan, the city of Milan. And Leonardo wanted him to hire him. And so he sent him, this is all the stuff I could do. I can make bridges and siege equipment and besieging uphill and I can do cannons and tunnel fortifications and uh, protection of infantry and more cannons and catapults and warships. And it's important to see that out of those 10 things, um, you know, like nine, eight or nine of them are war stuff because people were at war all the time in Italy and even the individual towns, the, the, like Florence and Rome and Milan and Sicily and stuff, they were fighting against each other and they were fighting against Spain and France. So somebody saying, look, I can, I can do all these brilliant things to keep your, your uh, soldiers safe. That was a, in some ways more important than the paintings I can do. But he did do significant paintings and sculptures too. P.S. I can do sculpture and paint. 
So here's a painting that Leonardo did and he could do perspective. So this is glaringly clear that this is one point perspective. And he did this when he was 21 years old. And so this means that he understood this in 1473, how to do that one point perspective. It's really clear. You can see it in the box in the foreground where it's really a box that looks like it, it's a normal top. And here's one of his famous gigs. And so this is, this is obviously one of the most important um, paintings of the world. It's the Last Supper. It's really big. So the Last Supper, the, the figures in the Last Supper are bigger than life size. It's the size of this wall, uh, this painting. So when you see that, like a little thing hanging up in somebody's living room, that's not what it looked like. It was really big. He was 42 when he did this. Um, and, and he made this very clearly the perspective. Okay, this is one point for second. And not only this, okay, somebody asked us you Is that one of our people on? Um, what happened? Okay. Oh, I see. Oh, okay, great. Uh, kids, I can see if every I'm hoping everybody can see if you are on the chat and you can't see, uh, you can't hear me. Has, has people check the chat to be sure that it's working. Yeah, we're in the All right. Okay, great. Um, what was I saying? Let's see something about perspective. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So this is this is clearly not only one point perspective, but it's one point perspective all about Jesus. I mean, this was to draw you right in to the main character of this painting. So there's no question that that's what this is about. Um, and this is clearly one point perspective and also bad temper techniques. So here's the thing about Leonardo. He was fussy and he wanted to work on paintings for hours and days and days and weeks and months. And he, he had significant things that he worked on over and over and over again for years and years and years. He worked for, on the Mona Lisa for 13 years. Well, doing tempera, doing frescoes requires somebody to put plaster on the wall and then somebody to sort of rapidly put pigment on it. He hated that because he couldn't tinker around with it. So what he did was he mixed oil into the plaster instead of water. And as a result, um, it didn't work. And so what happened is in his own lifetime, this painting, which is so iconic in our world, started to fall off the wall. And so it's been restored a number of times and it was recently restored so that it's not gonna do that, but it, start, it was already doing it by um, the end of the 1500s. So, um, and that was because he was fussy, really. Um, <clears throat> it's tied for the most reproduced and most famous and most parodied painting of all. And I think that's really true. Oh, and by the way, I have to remember to say this part, which is where, Jesus's feet should be was added later a few you know like a century later where somebody said hey let's put a door here sure go ahead cut through the painting and they did and so um, during the day during the time um, artists had drawn you know they drew uh, sketches of what this looked like and you would have been able to see Jesus's feet and to see where he was in this and what was going on under the table, like you can see in the other parts. But they decided, yeah, it's really more important to put this big door here. And so they did. And so it's a, it's a shame because you can see he's barefooted and he's sort of co uh, crossing his legs. And it's he's actually similar to the way he would have been on the cross. And it's a significant part of the painting. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, and this is the way you can, so this is kind of the way it would have been, but they didn't know what it looked like, so it's sort of dark down there. And um, here are all of the players. And one thing that we want to, I want to really point out is that this person next to Jesus looks like a woman and may have indeed been Mary, Mary Magdalene. And so um, when we think of these disciples, it's not always the indication that it's just guys. It could have been absolutely uh, Mary next to, next to Jesus. What are they eating? Does anybody know? I think it's really true that they're having guacamole. <laughs> and, and, and that's actually true. 
because they had avocados there and I think it's reasonable. So they're, they're having, you know, so it's biblical, it's, it's legit. And there's Mary, you know, saying let's have guacamole and chips. <laughs> oh, there's Eric Steven who just came on. Somebody admit Eric. Um, and you know, you can see this because of the parodies that happen all the time with regard to this painting. It, it's just incredible. How about this one? One of my favorites. Can you see who everybody is in there? There's Ellen DeGeneres and everybody else is a lesbian comedian or a bi comedian, which I think is great. And, and you know, if you were good, you could name all these people, but I also have a list here. Uh, so yeah, the whole gang, a couple of people I don't know, but most of them I do. So there you go, you can look that up. So let's go back to the Mona Lisa and talk a little bit about Mona. Um, she was done, so here's the deal. If you put, be careful because um, they may not be able to, well, they should be able to see that. Okay, there's some other chairs uh, there and there's two down here. There's a couple over here and there's a chair over there. Um, Mona Lisa uh, was, it, as I said, took Leonardo 13 years to paint and it was an oil painting. Oil painting was kind of new. So there's two over here. The gang, the gang is there. Um, uh, Amanda, why don't you? Oh, that's too late. Okay, there you go. Um, okay, three more people came. So the Mona Lisa was an oil painting, and that allowed Leonardo to futz around with it for thirteen years. Um, and, and again, it's tied for the most reproduced, it's tied with The Last Supper for being parodied and, and, and most famous and most parodied. Um, but here's the question. So here's a potential question for y'all. Why, she says, why am I the most famous painting in the world? Why is she so famous? Because it's just, it's not a huge painting. It's not a famous figure. It's relatively small. Why is it so famous? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of a smiling. You can, you can have a, a, a thing for that because she is smiling and she's enigmatically smiling, but there's another reason it's even more pop culture-y. Oh, well, that's later. And you don't get anything for that because you're giving away my stuff. Okay, no. Um, <laughs> I get, you, huh? Her eyes follow you. I think that happens in all paintings, but it's a great, it's a great point. Yes. It was stolen, yes, yes, that's what happened. The Mona Lisa was, you get a great prize for that because that's exactly right. The Mona Lisa was stolen and it was stolen in, uh, and so everybody knew that this happened. This happened in the 1900s, the early 1900s. And it was, you know, front page news in Paris it was stolen from the Louvre, um, front page news in the United States all sorts of everybody was talking about this nonstop and it was a big deal. The guy's name was Vincent Perugia. He stole the Mona Lisa from the Louvre in 1911. And most art thefts that happen from museums happen spontaneously. They're not like, it's not like Ocean's Eight where they plan the whole thing. And, you know, that isn't really the way it is. I like this too, that it says Leonardo's masterpiece in American newspaper, of course. Um, but uh, so it was stolen because in effect, Vincent Perugia, who was just a guy in it, he kind of like cleaned up and stuff at the Louvre, but he just saw the painting. There wasn't anybody around. He cut the painting out of the frame and rolled it up. Then he hide, hid it in a corner and then he came back later and took it out with his cleaning stuff. It was so easy for him to take it. And people would just kind of walk by and said, hey, there's, there's nothing in that frame. What the heck? So um, he hid it in Paris because he lived in Paris, but he was Italian. So he took it to Italy. And, and then after two years of incredible amounts of stress because he was afraid somebody would figure it out. And he also was afraid something bad would happen to it because he revered the painting. He brought it back and, or he, turned it in to the Italian government. And he didn't receive much of a sentence because he was in Italy and the people in Italy thought it was patriotism. You know, uh, they stole it, they had it in France. Why isn't it in, in Italy? Heck, why should he even, you know, of course he would do this. And, and that was kind of the deal. But 
everything that happened to the Mona Lisa was front page news for, for two years and after. And the, and the, the, um, the story of, of the theft just captured people's minds. So that's why it's so famous. Leonardo really only did 12 paintings, and these are they. Um, and in fact, at least one of these is probably not his painting. So when you think about Leonardo da Vinci and these two really incredible famous paintings about the Last Supper and, and, uh, and the Mona Lisa, that's it. He did these other ones and that's it. I mean, he's, it's more than Vermeer who, you know, and people say, oh, Vermeer only did 37 paintings. Yeah, well, Leonardo did 12 and that's, that's true. And part of it was because he was fussy. But all the, the thing that's really significant about Leonardo is <clears throat> the notebooks, his notebooks. So Leonardo drew, he had these notebooks that he did drawings and all sorts of different interesting things in. He, um, he did 13,000 pages of, of notebooks. And he didn't even start them until he was 30, which is significant as in itself. It had, and so one of the things they found about looking at Leonardo's notebooks is that he did hundreds of preliminary drawings for paintings that he never did. He's like one of those guys, you know, he's one of those guys who's like such a perfectionist that he never really got to anything. And, uh, and, and that's kind of significant. But on the other hand, the page, the notebook pages are amazing. He did 5,000 of the pages in mirror code. So let's look at this. <clears throat> which is called the Vitruvian, I can't see it very well. That's why I put these notes in here. So Vitruvian man, um, and it, it connects human beings to nature. And if you look at the writing at the top, it's written backwards. It's written as a mirror image backwards. Now, lots of people think that the reason he did that was because he was left-handed and he was using a quill pen. And if you're using an ink pen and you drag your hand over it, it makes a mess. And if you're doing it for 13,000 pages, it would get really tiresome after a while, I think. So, but he also wrote the stuff backwards. He wrote the letters backwards. And I think that's uh, significant about what an incredible genius he was. This particular drawing tells us a couple of things that, that you should recognize right now. If you wanna know how big something is, if you extend your arms, it's equal to your height. So if you're six feet tall and you want to know how, I, I actually had an employee one time who said, how big is this table? And I said, well, how tall are you? Stretch out your arms. And if, and he said, well, I'm six feet tall. And I said, Did it? and he said, I said, it's six feet. That's how you know. And he figured this out. He also figured out that human beings are about seven heads high. Right there, it makes it so much easier to figure out how to paint and draw somebody. Um, he, he did amazing stuff. He also did mathematics and engineering and geology and paleontology and astronomy and cartography, made amazing maps. He was a genius. He was a genius guy. So these things are telling you about that height. Um, <clears throat> and he did all these incredible things. Right? This is, this is a, like a bandsaw. This is a saw, an automatic power saw. And these, these potential flying machines and these, it, like the, how to make a bicycle chain, because that's really like a bicycle chain and these incredible botany things and these uh, incredible anatomy studies that he did that nobody else was really doing. Um, and he also did these incredible drawings that actually when you look at them, look like they have sound. If you see a, an image like that, this is a quiet serenity picture that got by on the bottom is screaming. Um, all, you know, people of all different walks of life. Look at that guy in the background. They're screaming at the top of his lungs. You can hear it almost. And, and he was aware that he could communicate that with drawing. So there's Leonardo. Now, from a queer perspective, and that's what we're here for, um, <clears throat> he never married. He never had children. In the hundreds of pages of his writing, of the thousands of pages of his writing, he never indicates sexual attraction for any woman. I don't think people who are writing a diary really could get away with that unless that was uh, uh, something that was the way they were. In one note, notebook, he stated the act of procreation is anything that has to do with relation to it. It is so disgusting that human beings would so die if there were no pretty faces and sensuous dispositions. It's like, 
you know, sex is so gross. That's what he's saying. <laughs> in, in, in 1476, he was accused of sodomy twice and he was arrested for uh, a sodomy two times. He was, uh, he didn't, he went to trial, he was acquitted. Oh yeah, he never went to trial, but, he, but that accusation scared him. There's probably frightened him. Sodomy was so common in Florence at the time, in Florence, Italy, that the German word for homosexuality was Florenza. <laughs> uh, Florenza. The word for to have anal sex was Florence. And directly related to Florence. This is his boyfriend. This is Sali, Sale. And um, his real name was Gian, Gian Giacondo, I'm not very good at this, Capriotti. Sale. This is him. And he's a handsome guy. He's a handsome guy. He came to um, live with Leonardo as an assistant when he was 10 years old. Um, he was trained as a painter. And everyone said that he was graceful and beautiful. And he delighted Leonardo. And he stayed with him for the rest of Leonardo's life. Leonardo said Sali was also a liar, a thief, stubborn, stubborn, and a glutton. And sometimes that happens with the boyfriend. <clears throat> Leonardo kept him close for 25 years and made him a rich heir when he died, when Leonardo died. Here's Sali. So this is the deal. Here's, here's Sali talking to Leonardo. He says, can I have a new suit? And Leonardo says, yeah, see, uh, can I have a new shoes? Uh, see, can I have another new suit? Oh, sigh, see, that's what it was. Leonardo was his sugar daddy. He was Sally's sugar daddy. And Sally, the word Sally means little devil. <laughs> I think that's, that was his, his nickname for him. So here's Le uh, Mona Lisa again. And by the way, I wanna say that Mona Lisa was the first time that there was a landscape in a painting that was an aerial landscape. So over her shoulders, it's like you're looking down on the landscape. And that's really the first time that uh, appeared in, in paintings. This is Mona Vanna. And it's another drawing, it means vain woman. And it's a drawing from his notebooks and from a, a, a drawing that Michelangelo or that uh, Leonardo did with his wacky assistants because it, it, there may have been assistants that worked on this as well. If you look carefully at this, this painting is possibly copied and probably by Sale, and it's Sale's face. It really is Sale's face. Now, if you look at it, um, it's sexy. This is a sexy drawing because remember all these other things that people have clothes on. And for Leonardo um, to have this naked woman is a significant thing. But if you also look at the hands in the, in the drawing, it's they're male looking hands in a lot of ways. They also, some scholars believe that Sully was the model for Mona Lisa because look at the hands, look at the, the position that they're sitting in. And it's very, very similar. And remember it's 13 years. I don't know about you, but for me to look the same 13 years later, it's not happening in my life right now. This painting is John the Baptist by Leonardo, and it's Sally again. He is the, um, the model for that. And this one over here was Sally as Bacchus, also the model for that painting. <clears throat> this is a painting by Sally where he is painting himself as Jesus. Um, now, in all honesty, it's a lot easier to have a... Um, model of to use yourself as a model than to hire people to be a model because you're always there. I was an art student and I know what that's like. It's a lot easier to just paint a picture of yourself. And we'll see that a lot. This is Sully's only signed work. He did it in 1511 as Jesus. And it sold just a few years ago in, in 2017 for $650,000. It's not a particularly great painting, but it's from Leonardo's studio. And indeed, it's by Leonardo's boyfriend. Leonardo, the scientist, wrote, the penis does not obey the order of its master, who tries to erect it or shrink it at will, whereas instead the penis erects freely while its master is asleep. The penis must be said to have its own mind by any strength of the imagination. I think that's true, although I don't know that personally. <clears throat> this is... a little picture of Sally from Leonardo's notebooks. 
And this is what, uh, this is from his notebook. And this is what it actually looks like. Take a, take a little picture there. <laughs> Obviously a mind of its own. And so, um, and this is from his notebook. This is also from his notebook, from the margin of his notebook. It's this, <laughs> which I think is really funny. I mean, like, it's just really funny. And over here, uh, the words, it says Sally's butt. It actually says Sally's butt, like that hole. Okay. Uh, Sally's butt. All right. Sally inherited the Mona Lisa and several other paintings. That's what made him so rich. This drawing by uh, Leonardo is that Leonardo drew himself and Sally as one person. Uh -huh. Even Sigmund Freud said that Leonardo was not straight. That's our queer perspective. Now, <clears throat> all right, changing the tone a little bit. This is my mom. And she's going to Europe with my dad in 1957. And, uh, uh, this is a great story. So, and they went, they went to Italy and they saw, went to Pompeii. There she is in Pompeii and there they are in the bubbly gardens in Florence. And here she is right here resting. She's resting because <laughs> she's pregnant with me. And hi everybody, in 65 years, I'll be teaching you queer art history. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> So, and that's, a, by the way, this is the way women looked in the 1950s. <clears throat> and so they went, they went to Rome and this is the, the uh, St. Peter's um, Basilica. And I just went through this picture in because I wanted to, and, and they went for fun because they figured we're having this little bratty little baby. So what are we gonna do now? Let's go to Europe now. My mother had never been to Europe and she they just decided to go. They also went for my dad's job. And in this picture, I also threw in this thing because Fiat still has this car now. I mean, in that color, for heaven's sakes. Okay, my dad was a um, editor at Doubleday. And here he is talking to Irving Stone and Irving Stone uh, was a, a sort of a friend of his. And Irving Stone was, he, my dad went to Italy, went to um, both Rome and Florence with my mom, but also to meet Irving Stone because Irving Stone was, was writing The Agony and the Ecstasy, which is an, a biography, biographical novel of Michelangelo. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and here is my mom. She's happier now because she's hanging out with this woman who was Irving Stone's wife, Jean Stone. And Jean Stone actually was the researcher and the editor of all of Irving Stone's books. She was very, very significant. She wrote parts of them. Of course, she didn't get any recognition on that, but she was, he was not successful without her. Agony and the Ecstasy came out in 1961. It was still, so I was born in 1957. So it's still four years before the movie comes out or before the uh, book comes out. And, but it, when it did, it sold 6 million copies. It was very, very popular. And one of the reasons that, um, so one of the, the reasons that they were in Italy was because they actually went there, uh, Irving Stone and his wife, Jean, to immerse themselves in, in the Italian Renaissance circumstances so that they would be able to write this brilliant book. And um, they actually lived there for four years. And I'm sure that Doubleday said to my dad, could you go over there and see what the heck he's doing? Come on, hurry up. This is four years. This is costing us a lot of money. Um, but they came, he came out with a wonderful book and it did turn out to be worth uh, a lot because it sold six million copies. Irving Stone was able to get away with that because he had written Lust for Life. What was Lust for, oh, you already says. It says right there. Lust for Life was about a biographical novel about Vincent van Gogh. <clears throat> and it came out in the 1930s and it sold 35 million copies. And Lust for Life, uh, Irving Stone um, was a, a very good writer. And when in the 1920s, he went to, uh, he was in Europe um, and he went to a little gallery in Paris and he saw an exhibition of, uh, I'm sort of digressing here, but he saw an exhibition of Vincent van Gogh's work. And he was blown away. He'd never seen this work before. He was absolutely enchanted by it and went back after he married Jean uh, Stone. They, he decided to write a book about, uh, Vincent van Gogh, and he did, and it pretty much sucked because nobody would um, would take it. Seventeen uh, 
publishers turned it down. So Jean took it, rewrote it, called it Lust for Life, did all of this kind of stuff, porked it up, and it was able to really be very, very successful. And that's how significant she was. Before that book and the movie, <clears throat> which came out uh, in the 1950s. This is Kurt Douglas, who looked exactly like, uh, he, looked, he looked exactly like Vincent Van Gogh to the point where Michael Douglas, his son, really was like confused. He was like, so, and he said to his brother, well, wait, why does Vincent Van Gogh look so much like dad? So um, when he did this, when he wrote the book and when the movie came out, then people knew who Vincent van Gogh was. Before he wrote that book, nobody in the United States knew who Vincent van Gogh was. And now everybody knows, and it's because of Irving Stone. So that's how I got away with all this four-year thing and everything. It's very nice though, and he took my mom and dad around to see, to see Italy, and it was a fun tour. And my, I remember my mother speaking about how, what a fun time it was. Now, The Agony and the Ecstasy was made into a movie in 1965. So here's the movie, and Charlton Heston played uh, McLean and, um, and Rex Harrison played, and there they are, he played Pope Julius and Pope Julius. And so the whole movie is about this antagonism between Pope Julius and Michelangelo about painting the Sistine Chapel. And Pope Julius was, uh, it's interesting that um, uh, to, he, this way he really looked. And Rex Harrison actually grew a big beard to be, do this part. And then the like Hollywood producer said, no, you just were in, uh, you know, you were just in My Fair, Lady, My Fair Lady, everybody thinks you're handsome, cut the beard off because people are gonna wanna see you. It didn't have anything to do with her reality, but that's the way Pope Julius looked. Um, and this is the way Leonardo or uh, 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 Michelangelo looked. And I think this is really the way he looked. If you look at these paintings by uh, different people and self portraits of him, that's the way he looked. <clears throat> So um, Charlton Heston isn't too far off from him, but there are some reasons why he's not. Michelangelo, uh, Lodovico Buonarroti Simoni, that was his name, and he lived from 1475 to, 16, uh, to 1564. Never married, never had children, okay. Um, pope Julius was a, a, a warrior pope, and he was actually uh, ruling the papal states throughout Italy, he created the Swiss Guard. He was a patron of the arts. He wanted arts to, to flourish in Rome and in Florence. And so he forced Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel. Um, and so <laughs> this, so there's Char Charlton Heston angstily painting the Sistine Chapel. And when they made this movie, they actually recreated the entire ceiling of the, of the Sistine Chapel for the shots in the movie. Um, but in reality, Michelangelo was a sculptor. He wasn't a painter. He was really worried about not being able to do this. He was a devout man in a lot of ways. And he didn't think he was gonna be able to do it. And he really didn't wanna do it. And, and in fact, <clears throat> he ran away several times and Pope Julius would send armies to drag him back to continue to paint. This took him four years to do it. I just wanna throw in that little arrow there as to pointing out that whenever Michelangelo made a sculptor of, of a guy, a lot of times it was an eight pack a big eight pack, not a six pack, an eight pack. Um, and so this piece was Michelangelo's first sculpture. And he was 15 when he made this incredible flat uh, uh, raised, um, incredible carving. I don't, you know, like, you know, it's not like he had a little tool, a power tool to do this. I don't even know how you do this kind of stuff. It's amazing. But this is his earliest known work. <clears throat> it took him probably two, uh, two years to do it, 15 to 17. Co-starring Diane Cholento as Catesina de' Medici. You who preach the beauty and nobility of the human body, put it down to yours. You sit down here. You smell. Yeah. Okay, I think that's important to point out. <clears throat> now, that was, uh, by the way, that actress was Diana Ch Chilento, who was married to Sean Connery at the time, so she was big, famous. Michelangelo was very, very famous, and when he started to paint the Sistine Chapel, um, that's why Pope Julius wanted him to do it, because he was a very, very famous artist, and he wanted the prestige of having Michelangelo do it. He thought he could do it. 
Here is a, a painting that was done by Raphael, and that's Michelangelo right there. It's called the School of Athens, and um, there he is. So that is actually supposed to be Michelangelo, but Raphael painted, he was an enemy of Michelangelo. He didn't like him, and he, they really hated each other. And he painted him as philosopher Heraclitus, who was actually about change, that's the philosophy, but he was also really grumpy, really grumpy. And it's sort of funny because Michelangelo was really grumpy. Um, so the Hollywood kiss thing, there is no evidence that, that she was supposed to be playing one of the Medici women who was married, that there was ever any relationship between that woman and Michelangelo, but it was Hollywood and it was Charlton Heston. But the smell part, well, <clears throat> Apparently Michelangelo was, he was dirty. He, I can't see this though, but he was dirty and he was grumpy and he was, he never changed his clothes. He worked uh, for four years nonstop on this. He never changed his clothes. He never took a bath. He stank. He was absolutely, he, he did stink. And in fact, they say that when he took his boots off, which were leather, his skin would come off because he just didn't wash. He was stinky. Um, but he did magnificent work. And so I really wanna talk about the Pieta because I think it's amazing. And uh, the Pieta means the pity and the Pieta sculptures always are Mary holding Jesus on, his, on her lap after Jesus has been taken off the cross. Um, he was 24 when he did that piece, but, let's, uh, but in, before he did that, <clears throat> There were pietas that were actually started in Germany and they looked like this. And so um, they started in Germany and then ultimately in, in Italy, early in the 1400s, um, uh, Michelangelo did that pieta late in the 1400s, I believe, or just about uh, 15, maybe 1501. If you look at these, they are awkward. Look at that one at the top middle. I mean, this is not comfortable looking situation. Michelangelo pulled off this incredibly beautiful piece by making Mary's head the size of a regular woman, but making her body huge and covering it with incredibly carved folds of fabric. So if you look at her face, her face is smaller than Jesus's, but her hand is enormous compared to his hand. And her body is huge. Look at how wide her shoulders are. But he managed to make it so that you don't even notice that, which is incredible. It's just incredible. And he, he did this when he was a young man. Um, so, so here is this picture there. And here is a little, uh, so what happened was, I think he was 24 when he did this piece, uh, 24. And um, this is bigger than life size, a little bit bigger than life size. And he came into one time when this was on view and he heard somebody say, who, who did this? And somebody said, so it's some artist from Milan. And that was not him and he was pissed. He never signed his work, but he signed this piece as a result. He actually regretted that, but that's what it says on that stripe going over her chest. It says, I, Michelangelo Buonarroti made this. Um, and if you look at the incredible folds of this fabric, this is all out of one piece of marble. I don't, it's amazing. And this beautiful, beautiful face uh, that's so um, convincing and, and fits with this. And there you can see that, that stripe on there, an incredible fabric. But also you can see in that how huge her hand is. Um, so they decided, so it's 1964, and they packed it up in a six-ton package, and they sent the Pieta to, anybody know? where they took it to, huh? Yes, Gerald gets a prize. The New York World's Fair, there it is. This is the New York World's Fair. So in 1964, uh, it was one of the last really big World's Fairs in the, in the world. Um, uh, it was just outside of New York City, um, as part of New York City area, you could take, uh, so how many people here actually went to the World's Fair? Is anybody here who went to the World's Fair? Oh, am I the, <laughs> did you? Did you? Okay. I was there as a little kid. Um, so I would have been seven or eight when, when my father and my mother, and you know, if you're a young person in those days, when your dad went to the world's fair, he wore a suit. You know, I thought, think about that when I see people going into Dorney park in their, in their <laughs> swimsuits, you know, 
So um, it was an incredible World's Fair and the commercials on TV said uh, that you could see commercials and they would show these people jumping on the subway and it, taught, it cost 15 cents to go from the middle of New York to go out to, um, to see it. I mean, what was it in the Bronx or in Queens. Brooklyn? It was in Queens, okay. And you could still see that big uh, world thing there. But World's Fairs lasted for years. So it was open for two years and uh, countries and um, corporations built enormous pavilions that people could go and see. 51 million people went to the New York World's Fair in 1964 and 65. And this is the Vatican Pavilion. And that's where they had the Pietà. So as a result, they actually had a conveyor belt in front so that people wouldn't linger in front of it because so many people were seeing it. They didn't want people to stand there because they bottleneck the whole place. We didn't go because, you know, we didn't go to see the Pietà because I, my, my dad is just was not interested in religious stuff. I don't think he would ever have chosen to do that. In 1971, a guy named Laszlo Toth wielding a geologist hammer. He was a geologist, actually, he was crazed. He attacked the Pieta and it had gone back to the Peter, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican and he hit it with a hammer and he broke Mary's arm off at the elbow. He broke her nose. This picture of her broken nose is so horrible. Chipped her eyelid and of course, everybody that was looking at it jumped him. And uh, he was luckily, he, he was screaming, I am, the, I am the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, they never charged him. They committed him to a psychiatric hospital for several years, and then he kind of disappeared after that. But he did these horrible things to the Pieta. Now, they repaired it. And although it says here they repaired it in, th I wrote, three months, they repaired most of it in three months. The hardest part was her eyelid. It actually broke her eyelid, and they were able to repair it so that you cannot tell that this happened. Thank goodness. Also, one of his other greatest hits, is this gay poster boy. Um, it's the David, and he did this when he was 26, again, out of one single huge piece of marble. And the David is such a beautiful piece. Um, in, when you look at the David, you see that the head is kind of big, and that's because it was supposed to be going on top of a giant tower in the middle of, of Florence. It's still in Florence. I have seen this in, in person. Um, if you don't make the head bigger, it looks like the when you're down on the ground looking way up at the top of it, it looks like the head's a little pin pinhead. So they made it a big, he, Michelangelo made it big, but then they liked it so much they didn't want to put it on the tower. So now he's just got a big head and a big butt. He's got this butt. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons it's a poster child. It's also a big sculpture. You can see how big it is compared to those people standing at the base. Um, so, in 1500s Florence, police often ignored gay activity, but also they created the Office of the Night, which was the anti-gay police. So this is the queer part of this. And, and so they did have these uh, folks. And in the late 1500s, 1700 citizens were implicated in sodomy uh, arrests, 400 a year in a city that was only 40K, only four. 40,000 people. So in over a 30 year period, a total of, um, of 3,000 people were convicted. And the main space where they were arrested was the Ponte Vecchio, which is a little shopping area on, uh, in, in Italy. I've actually been there. Now remember that Leonardo himself was charged twice and the popes and other leaders did this to moralize the city. They didn't want all these you know, queer people to be doing these terrible things. And so as a result, a lot of queer people, the brilliant um, creative class left, they, they fled. And uh, you know, it was Leonardo. But then they realized that they wanted excellence on the art and they had created a brain drain. All the famous great artists who were Queer, and it was a lot of them. I mean, both Michelangelo and, and Leonardo, you'll see that fits into this category. Uh, they, they were, you know, concerned about leaving. So they decided, so some of the uh, guys got together, including um, Duke Cosimo de' Medici, who was in charge of Florence at that time. He's the ruler of Florence. He, among other things, he, Cellini, the sculptor Cellini, and here's a sculpture by Cellini. <clears throat> 
had been chased out of town. He was openly gay and he left town because they said, you can't do that. You're going to get in tree and we're going to arrest you and we're going to take your, your stuff and we're, you're, it's going to be terrible. And this is one of his sculptures. And so he left, he left, he went to a different country. And then what they did was they said, uh oh, now we don't have anybody to do this great art. What are we going to do? Okay, we'll pay him to come back. We'll give him amnesty to come back. And so they gave him amnesty for his queerness to come back. The Office of the Night documents, this is so amazing. Because this happened, they actually documented all these arrests and all these circumstances and everything. And they archived it in Florence and it actually shows this really rich, diverse uh, Renaissance LGBTQ culture in more than 16 miles of shelf space. All these things, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and women too were also arrested for, for sodomy charges. All right, jumping a little bit into now, there is a movie called, or there's a book called The Celluloid Closet, and it was written by Rita Russo, Vito Russo, and it was about all this sort of gay coding and queer coding all through uh, movies in the, from silent era all the way up into the 1990s. And um, Vita Rosso uh, passed away from AIDS, but Lily Tomlin wanted to create a movie that was about the celluloid closet. And so as a result, um, they asked Charlton Heston if he would be in the movie to talk about how Michelangelo was probably gay. And um, this is Charlton Heston. And you know, Charlton Heston was the head of the, he was the president of the National Rifle Association at near the end of his life. <clears throat> so here he is, and he didn't want to do it because I absolutely know that Michelangelo wasn't gay. I absolutely know it. How could he know that? How could he know that? Well, he knew it. Yeah, so, um, and he did. So that, so what the, if you didn't hear that, what he said at the beginning, they said obscenity, uh, shameful, shameful, obscenity. And then he says, uh, and then Pope Julius says, what do you say to this? And he says, I will paint. Well, you heard what he said. He said, I'll paint man as God made him in the glory of his nakedness. Okay. This is the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo painted this in four years all by himself every bit of this it's amazing and he and he he painted it between 1508 to 1512 under the patronage of pope julius which means that pope julius paid for it michelangelo was really a sculptor he painted this under duress it it he painted it on his own and he got paid he got paid about three thousand ducats which is about i actually think it's more like a million dollars today it's still not very much money. This is the guy lying on his back. Have you ever painted a ceiling? It's a pain in the ass. Now imagine doing it every day for four years and having to paint carefully with your arm over your head. Um, so uh, it's re so the, the Sistine Chapel is about the Genesis. It's about the beginning parts of the Bible. And yet, <clears throat> Frankly, and it has this right in the middle, which is, is God giving life to Adam. But frankly, Michelangelo liked beefcake. He really did. And so when you look at this, you can see, you know, naked guys. Look at this painting down here at the bottom where you have these still, I can see if, if you can do this right here, these guys were just so fabulous. And they and they're flying with the, and this is like a devil symbol here. So, and then what's this guy doing? I mean, you know, these women are delivering the laundry and they're saying, what did this guy just have sex? What's going on? And and if you if you look at this, I mean, just like fabulous guys have, who have nothing to do with the beginning of the Bible at all. We'll see that there's lots of naked guys in this, in the glory of their nakedness, for heaven's sakes. So this is the Sistine Chapel, and it has all these different Bible stories in it that are right from the beginning of the Bible. But it also has these guys, and these are naked guys. Um, and uh, this is what they were saying was obscene. They're called the ignudi, and it's a phrase coined by Michelangelo to describe the 20, 20 seated 
male nudes he incorporated into the Sistine Chapel fresco for no reason at all. The interesting thing is, and this is actually the interesting thing is, this is a quote from a historian. The interesting thing is that they don't fit into the theme of the paintings. So their true meaning has been a mystery in the art world. Uh-huh, yeah, no, no. Let's look at this from a queer perspective. <clears throat> And let's look, he painted these buff men over and over. So, so here's a little uh, scene in the middle. The scene in the middle is God, that guy with the white beard, not really that big in the picture, is, is dividing the um, land from the, from the waters. And that's allegorically spelled out in that picture. And then there's these four naked guys. And here they are. So here's these 20 naked guys just casually propped up around the scenes. And they're big. They're bigger than, uh, than human, um, than, than, you know, all the other pictures. It's just these guys, these guys who are just so naked and so buff. And they have these eight packs too. And, and, they're, and you can sort of see why somebody said these are kind of obscene, you know? So um, here is, uh, somebody's trying to come into the waiting room. Um, here, you know, there's got, not only do they have, uh, you know, Pope Julius didn't say paint 20 naked guys in here. <laughs> and by the way, there are 20 of them. They also have a little bit of this. I mean, there's always a little bit of dick showing in each of the paintings, which is kind of interesting. So, <laughs> so um, also there's a lot of paintings I'm really glad you're laughing um, because it's supposed to be funny. There's a lot of paintings of guys' butts, of guys' butts. And this is amazing. So about a hundred years later, uh, a new Pope came in and said, there's just too many guys' butts, cover them up. So they painted fabric over them. This is after Michelangelo had died and they painted the fabric over them, but then it was restored <laughs> and, and, and they cover and they uncovered the butts again. So um, this was just, you know, maybe in the last 50 years, this happened. Now, the funny thing is, this is God's butt. This is actually God's butt because God is on the right here. Can somebody let this person in so that the, um, I'm just going to do it. Um, so, so this is God over here on the right, and he's doing his thing. And then he's in this picture, he's supposed to be spinning around, flying away with his butt showing. And these guys are going, look, it's God's butt. Should we tell him? I don't know. It's showing, you know? And, and by the way, whenever Michelangelo did lots of sculptures, he always had the, the foot go like that with his toe like that. And they, people think that that's because he had a boyfriend that had that anomaly. Michelangelo believed in spiritualism, which meant that he believed he could speak to God directly, which is really uncomfortable for the Catholic Church, because that's the job of all of those people, including the Pope and priests and everything. So they didn't like him, and they didn't like it that he said that. And perhaps he felt he was talking to God, and God said, yes, show everybody, moon everybody, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll do that. <clears throat> yes. So... <laughs> And it's raining men. It, it really is. In this, <laughs> this is a part that's of the ascension. This is a part at the end of the, not on the ceiling, but at the end of the uh, basilica. And if you look at this, you'll see lots of butts and lots, and then some of them are covered up. So like, I don't know why that guy's butt is covered, but um, then some of them have this demure little piece of fabric cutting the, covering that thing. And I'm sure that was added later because it's not the glory of their nakedness. Um, so there's just that little covering of the, of the thing. Okay, of the dick. So here is uh, Adam and Eve. So, um, by the way, it's not an apple tree. It's a fig tree because God hates figs. And um, if you ever read the Bible about figs trees, you'll see that God and Jesus just hate figs. They condemn fig, fig trees over and over and over again. For some reason, it's a fig tree in there. And you can tell by the leaves. But also in this picture is this snake who is clearly a woman, not a snake. And you can tell it's a woman because she has a breast. So that's kind of condemning of the, it's not even just that Eve did the wrong thing. It was actually a woman snake. Another clue that Michelangelo may have been part of our queer community. 
he sucked at painting women. He really, really did. So let's take a close up of Eve. Take a look at Eve's arm in this. I mean, I've known a lot of buff butch women, but I have never seen somebody who's had an arm like that. And often his stuff just looks like it took a man's body and stuck breasts onto it. In fact, and look at this woman. I mean, really, this is one of the prophets, the Sybil. These folks are going, oh my God, look at this woman's guns. I can't believe it. And, and you know, whoa, look at that. In this breasts stuck on to a man's body. I mean, look at that. What is that? I mean, what is that? It looks like a Tootsie Roll on there at the end of the body. Obviously, Michelangelo never actually saw any real breasts, but he did show the butts. There was plenty of butts, I and mean, he was pretty good at butts, particularly men's butts. <clears throat> Here's a, 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 a statue, looks like a man's body. This is night. This is on Pope Julius's tomb with these breasts just stuck onto the front of the thing. It was so weird looking. I mean, what, you know, well, it's not like uh, people during the Renaissance couldn't paint women. I mean, this is Titian's um, uh, Venus and Verbino, 1538, which is just a few years after Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel, about 20, well, about 30 years. But even uh, Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, that was 1484. People could paint women that looked like women. They didn't have to stick the breasts on. <clears throat> Meanwhile, lots of guys kissing. This is supposed to be the last judgment. So apparently, hey, go for it. I mean, at the, at the, at the last judgment, this, is, this was the moment that we went to it. And also in the last judgment, you can see that this is um, uh, God, or actually it's God is sort of above this. And this person who is one of God's guys, I guess, maybe St. Peter, is whole, and he's demurely covered up, is holding this flailed skin. And if you look closely at the face, it's Leonardo. Leonardo, that was his male, insert, male artists often insert themselves into paintings. This was his insertion of himself, which I think is interesting. It's really interesting. Here it is in the big, there he is. Here it is in the big giant thing. So there he is right there. There's, there's, this is, God is up there at the top, um, the big figure. <clears throat> and you can see God has an eight pack. In fact, God has a 12 pack in this. He's serious. Look at this. Look at that guy. Look at just, it's so much, but all it's amazing uh, 12 pack bodies. But if you look at this woman, somebody just stuck her breasts on with, you know, it's like scotch taped her breasts on. Okay, so now this guy is a 20 year old, old Tommaso de Cavaliere, and his nick, nickname was Tomai. And he was a Renaissance heartthrob. And here is another picture of him that Michelangelo did. He was the main boyfriend of Michelangelo. And Michelangelo met him in Rome in 1532. He was quite young. Uh, he was beautiful, physical grace, sensitive personality. And, and Michelangelo was 30 years older than he was. And, and in fact, Tommaso was a nobleman, but they had a significant mutual attraction and they had a developed a 30 year relationship. And in fact, he stayed with him until uh, uh, Tomai was with Michelangelo on the day that he died um, at his bedside. Michelangelo wrote him gushing long letters and poetry. Here he is, and here's Tomai, and here's something he said, may I burn if I do not love thee with all my heart and lose my soul if I feel for any other. It's kind of clear, I think, you know, it's, I don't think there's equivocation there. Why should I desire, why should I seek to ease intense desire? This is so queer, you know, <clears throat> with still more tears and windy works of grief. If only chains and bands can make me blessed, no marvel if, if alone and naked I go, an armed cavaliere, captive and slave confessed. Not understated. And, and he sent Tommaso drawings and dedicated 30 passionate love sonnets to him. Their relationship lasted until Michelangelo's life and when he died 31 years later. Tommaso was at his bedside and Michelangelo left an estate equal to $50 million. You know, he never really ate anything. He never got new clothes. He just banked everything. And apparently he gave, he left some of that money to Tommaso. 
He didn't have any heirs. He fell for this guy uh, earlier before Tommaso. His name was Francesco Zanobi Bracci uh, Cecchino, I think is how you say that. But he died, but this young man died quite young in 1544. And Michelangelo designed his tomb, Cecchino's tomb, and he put on it, buried here is the Bracci, which is him, with whose face God wished to correct nature. He never wrote this about women. Here is the tomb and uh, Cicino, uh, here's a little poem that Michelangelo wrote to Cicino. The earthy flesh and here my bones deprived of their charming face and beautiful eyes do yet attest for him how gracious I was in bed. Then when we, he embraced in what the soul doth live. Pretty clear. This statue that he did of Bacchus was actually before Tom I was born, before, um, before he did the Ignudi. But if you look at the face, it's really similar to Tomai's face and the Ignudi's face. It was his type. He liked that type. Other lovers were his, his constant companion servant, Francesco Rubino. And this guy, Andrea Quaretas, Quaretis, who was infatuated with Michelangelo and expressed a desire to crawl on all fours to see the artist one night in 1532. <laughs> about him, he said, Michelangelo said, uh, talked about himself being um, shot by Cupid's arrows. One Michelangelo sonic declares that the highest form of love cannot be for a woman because a woman is not worthy of a wise and virile heart. And the last thing that about him, he, this is this is such a like middle school poem. I know, you know that I know, my Lord, that you know that I draw close to take pleasure in you. And you know that I know that you know who I am. Really? I mean, you know, you, we've all been there. So why do you delay our acknowledging each other? Because well, I know that you know that I know. So... Okay, here's the last thing I want to say about Michelangelo, which I think is hilariously funny. So see this, this is from the Sistine Chapel, and this is Isaiah. And Isaiah, this is a painting of Isaiah that Michelangelo did. Can anybody guess what this image was the inspiration for? And I'll give you a hint. It was a cover of a Saturday Evening Post by Norman Rocco. Does anybody know? Oh, Gerald knows. You know, don't you, Gerald? <laughs> Does anybody else know? Go ahead, Gerald. Rosie it's Rosie the Riveter. Let's see her. Come on, Rosie. There she is. Look at that. And we're not kidding about this. This is really true. Look at the arm. Look at the way it's helped. Even the feet. Absolutely, this was the inspiration for um, Norman Rockwell to paint Rosie the Riveter in that shape of Isaiah. Uh, of Isaiah. Now, this is not the way uh, Norman Rockwell painted. He didn't take somebody's face and then imagine her. He dressed the person up, took a photograph of her and then projected it onto the canvas and then painted it that way. But you can see that it's really is from that Michelangelo painting. Um, and here's this. So um, here's Rosie the Riveter and that's me. And that's me when I, I don't look like that anymore. Um, but uh, I actually, uh, this is a picture that was taken of me in graduate school. And I hope that the person who took this picture 42 years ago is on this, um, this Zoom tonight. I said, told her, she's my Facebook friend, thank goodness for social media. And I said, I think I'm gonna mention her, it's Jane Plake. And she took this picture of me. And she, I said, I want you to take a picture of me that so I look like Rosie the Riveter. And, uh, and she was saying, now well, lift your head a little bit. And I remember that so well. Um, but, so that's my insertion the artist insertion of this. By the way, not all Renaissance painters were white. <clears throat> uh, so this guy, Juan de Pereja, he was taught by Diego Velazquez. Um, he was a black painter and I uh, wish we knew more about him, um, but I want people to know that not everybody was white. How many Italian Renaissance women painters can you name? Can anybody name anybody besides Artemisia Gentileschi? Anybody? You didn't even know Artemisia, did you? Yes! Sophonisba, I've got a picture up here. This is Lavinia Fontana, but this is Sophonisba. Sophonisba Aguasola, you get another prize. Yippee, yay. So this is, uh, and these two women say, say, for heaven's sakes, we were before Artemisia. Why are we not talking about her? Well, we don't have time. 
So we're talking about Artemisia Gentileschi tonight because I'm so fascinated by her. And this is a self-portrait of her. And this is another self-portrait. It's actually a self-portrait. So, um, uh, and by the way, the great thing about Artemisia is all of her women figures have her sleeves rolled up because they're really seriously working. They're, they're busy, you know, they've got their sleeves rolled up. There she, there's the other one. And um, in this, <clears throat> she was good. So, so uh, she was a Renaissance painter. She was great at individual figures, but she wasn't good at those large crowds. Why not? Right, women, oh, God, absolutely right. Thank goodness. You're like a plant in the audience for me. Okay, but I do want to say thank you very much for that. That's absolutely right. Um, women were not allowed to go into other studios. They weren't allowed to paint large groups of people. They weren't allowed to paint male uh, models. And so that's why frequently all of these different pictures look like her because she used herself frequently as the model for this allegorical painting. She was a genius, by the way. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi self-portrait as um, as an allegorically as as the uh, allegorically as a painting, and over here is an actual just self portrait of her. Her father was a guy named Orazio Gentileschi. He was a painter. That's how she learned because he trained her. And by the time she was nineteen, she was a skilled artist. But he wanted to place her into another. Um, uh, a better artist's uh, studio. So he arranged for her to marry this guy, Agostino Tassi. And um, when she went to his studio, when she was not married to him yet, he raped her. And it was a terrible, terrible situation. It's a long story about this whole circumstance. But one of the things that happened to her was that she had to endure a terrible trial. And Tassi, Agostino Tassi was not really punished at all. And she was pissed. She was pissed. So then she started doing paintings like this. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of reasons why she did paintings. So we're gonna talk about this, but this painting is Judith slaying Holofernes. And it's a biblical story where Judith, who was a, um, a, a Jewish uh, widow and her, uh, her tribe of people in her beautiful town was, about, was taken over by the, um, by, uh, an army from Assyria and Holofernes was the general of the army and they were gonna destroy the town, kill all the people. So she said, I'm gonna deal with this. So she was pretty and she went to his tent and she convinced him that she was gonna fool around with him but she got him really drunk and cut off his head. And whenever you see these paintings of Judith and Holofernes, the maid is always there too. So I like it that there's two women. And by the way, their sleeves are rolled up because this is serious <laughs> business. They are at work. <clears throat> And so um, now this painting is by Lucas Cranach, and this is done a little bit sooner than earlier than this is about, to, about 90 years earlier. But when you see men creating these paintings, they're not quite so serious. And I, I mean, this woman's sleeve isn't even rolled up. She's not even dirty. And she's supposed to have cut this guy's head off. And you know, the, the sword isn't even dirty. So, um, so Artemisia's paintings, and that's why I say that Artemisia is a genius, because she was able to evoke this incredible mood from these paintings that I think was very dramatic. She became a successful court painter. And here she is. This is another Judith in Holofernes. So often the paintings are Judith holding the sword with the maid. They're getting away, and they got the head in a basket. And, and that's what's happening in this. And by the way, and here's another one. You know, they're getting away. This is also by her, by Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, <clears throat> her maidservant, and again, sleeves rolled up. These sleeves are really, you know, they are working, they're really, they're ready to go. This is really serious business here. She taught other artists. She was lauded by Michelangelo III, who's the nephew of Michelangelo. She hung out with Galileo. She had a daughter and taught her how to paint. Um, and, and she was, and people said in Michelangelo, uh, nephew said she was not she was okay at faces but she was terrific at fabric so look at the incredible painting of that fabric uh, of the different pieces of fabric that are in this painting really extraordinary uh, and and evocative this painting another one i you know these are not they're serious business here uh this is jail and sisera and this is a story where jail is uh 
has to rescue the people in her tribe and and in and, and um, Cicero is a bad guy and he she's managed to get him drunk and she's about to hammer a tent stake into his ear, which I think will pretty much take care of this problem. I think that's what a kind of the story. And Slee's rolled up. She's she's at business. She's at work. She jail says to Cicero, go boast before your father in hell and tell him that you have fallen into the hands of a woman. Here's, Artem, or here's a, a painting that's St. Cecilia playing a lute, but if you look carefully, you can see it's a self-portrait again. This is Artemisia's face um, and her sleep robe. And there's about 57 works by Artemisia Gentileschi, 94% of them, 49 of them feature a woman as a protagonist or equal to men. And that's a big deal because that never happened in the paintings by the men. Uh, even those that Lucas Cranach, it's just, it's a weak character. This one, another one of the Judith and Holofernes ones. <clears throat> so um, this, uh, Art critic um, said, this is a woman art critic, and she wants to counter the readings uh, where, and she wants to refuse to see that Jonathan, Judith and Holofernes are always the responses to what happened to Artemisia during the rape trial and the trial. Instead, Pollock says, Judith and Holofernes is not a revenge theme, but a story of political courage and indeed collaboration by two women committing a daring committing a daring political murder in a war situation. They were at war and that's why she, she, that's what's happening in the story. A lot of people, a lot of critics of the day and all through history have said negative things about these paintings because it's not feminine. Yeah, we'll get over it. <clears throat> um, and, and then there's this painting this was the most recently attributed uh, painting, the most recently attributed to Artemisia Gentileschi. It was originally purchased in 1982 by the Toledo Art Museum in Toledo, Ohio, as a Cavallini painting, but then they figured out it was actually by Artemisia Gentileschi. This is Lot and his daughter, which is a story that's got its own problems, let's face it. But um, regardless, uh, their sleeves are rolled up. And why should they not have known that this was Artemisia? The sleeves are rolled up for heaven's sakes. The sleeves are rolled up in this. Look, we're serious, we're working here. All right, back to my mom and dad at the Bubbly Gardens and this, we're almost to the end now. <clears throat> this guy, that little statue is the fountain of little Bacchus in 15, so it's from 1560. It was in Florence and it was by Cigoli, Valerio Cigoli. And that was what the statue is there. This was a real guy and his name was Braccio di Bartolo. He was also known as Nano Morganti. And he and, and uh, Cosimo de' Medici, so what the Medici's family, you know, they were rulers and, and he was the head of Florence at the time. He had uh, Nano Morganti as his court jester. He was his court jester. They really had those in the mid uh, 16th century. <clears throat> People with anatomical differences were thought to be closer to God, but they were also thought to be monsters. It was um, horrible. But rich people then owned them as jesters. So Nano was given a retainer, meaning he had a salary, he had land, he was allowed to marry and fathered heirs, but he was a slave, he was owned as a possession, which was a terrible thing. But he was very well known. And so this painting is by um, Agnolo Brosini, who was, by the way, also gay. Um, and this is a portrait of a court jester. This is a portrait of him, of Nana Morganti. It's, you know, the painting is humiliating enough, but they have to put, to cover up his penis, they put a bird there. It's such a weird <laughs> thing. Like that'll, that'll you know, that's, everything's okay now because of this bird here. <laughs> Jesters were the smart original truth tellers who often mock human vices of vanity, snobbery, petulance, laziness, and greed. The court jesters aimed their humor at religion, hypocrisy, and incompetent rulers. And of course, that's what happens in Shakespeare when we have the fool who's mocking the, the, the main characters and telling the truth. So how does this all relate to the queer community? Well, it relates this way. We have always been the smart jesters though too frequently we're tagged as monsters. So the Mattachine, the word Mattachine 
were court jesters of the 13th century. They wore funny masks, they, they camped around, meaning they, they acted silly and they acted and they were flamboyant. But underneath the silliness, they were speaking the truth to the king and sometimes they were the only people in the kingdom who could get away with it. In 1950, the Mattachine Society began as one of the earliest LGBT gay rights organizations in the United States. It was the first organization and they were named after the court jesters was chosen. They were from the early 50s to mid 70s. And here's one of their ads that they handed out to people to support LGBT people. And it says here, homosexuals are different, but we believe that we have the right to be. Mattachines, um, the Mattachine Society defends the rights of homosexuals and tries to create a climate of understanding and acceptance. And that's where that word connects to us in present day. And these are our fools, our gay, queer, LGBT uh, people who tell the truth and, and represent that, that thing. The next group, so we're at the end now, the next event will be next week. Um, and that is going to be George O'Keefe and her circle. And uh, I hope everybody can be here for that. I do want to say that if you're online, please text to give to 44-321, and then you can give us a little donation. Now, who can name all these people? All right, let's start with, I'm going to turn my mic off. Oh, wait, no, then people won't hear me online. So at the top middle, who is that? Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes. That's too easy. You don't get a prize. Okay, the top right. Sean Hayes. Sean Hayes, Sean Hayes, Jack from, um, uh, just Jack uh, from um, Will and Grace. Okay, how about lower left? Lily Tomlin, Lily Tomlin as? Oh, What's her name? Oh, you're not Patricia saying that. See, you're all too young. Ernestine, her name was Ernestine. Uh, people online are going, it's Ernestine, but I can't hear you. Okay, what about the middle guy? <laughs> okay, Carmen says Paul Lynn. That's right. So if you didn't hear um, they, what we said, Wanda Sykes, Sean Hayes, Lily Tomlin as Ernestine, and Paul Lynn, who was the quintessential jester, queer jester. Okay, now the hard ones. The upper left. Oh, right. oh, upper left. He was in every Fred Astaire movie as a sissy. Ugh. You don't have enough of this queerness to make you know all the old movies, for heaven's sake. I bet, I bet Hannah, if Hannah was on, she would know. It's Franklin Pangborn. And if you see, and he, you know, he was absolutely part of the queer community. If you see these old um, movies with, with he, I mean, he was just such a sissy. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that you would see in, in the cell, cellular closet movie. How about the lower right? Does anybody know who that is? One of my favorite actors from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, we can't see it on this because of the, the thing that's down at the bottom, but um, uh, her initials are PK. Does anybody know who it is? Because she's got a monogram on her shirt. It's Patsy Kelly. So Patsy Kelly was uh, absolutely out. Not so true about Franklin Pan Pangborn, but Kat Patsy Kelly would actually say to reporters, yeah, I'm a big dyke. She'd actually say that in the 30s and 40s. And she was totally out and she was really funny. And then she sort of made a, a renaissance. So, you know, she, she had her own um, rise in the 1970s because she was in No, No, Nanette on um, Broadway. And she won a Tony for doing that. And she was quite a bit older. All right. That's the end.